Well, good evening. Hi. So nice to see an audience. Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. My name is Kimberly Jackson, and I'm the executive director. And briefly, before we begin, I always like to say a little bit about what the Institute is um, to our audience that's in person and to our virtual audience. Thank you so much for taking your time out on a Thursday to hear um, an infamous talk about Terry Schiavo and to be with us. But let me share a little bit about what the Institute is. The Institute was created by Congressman Bill Young. It was his thought process to create a space for nonpartisan discussion on social, political, and economic issues. And it's been an honor to take the mantle and have these conversations across our county, across our region, with our congressional leaders on issues that matter most to us. And I want to take time to thank our partners. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Peggy Land and U, um, WUSF, along with Tampa Bay Newspapers and our anchor sponsor, Duke Energy, for supporting us and helping us get through this very challenging COVID space in year. We are here for a very special reason, and that is because this young man next to me, <laughs> Judge George Greer, has graciously agreed to speak about Terry Schiavo for the first time. And for those of you all who did not know about the story, weren't impacted, it was instrumental in creating the legal precedent for how we deal with end of life issues, which is so important, particularly as we're coming out of a COVID environment for individuals to understand the scope of government, the scope of the legal system and how it intersects with private rights. And so before I introduce um, Judge Greer, we're gonna watch a little clip to show a little bit of the um, history of Terry Schiavo. Thank you. In the debate over a sick patient's right to die, there has rarely, if ever, been a case like the one in Florida. In 2003, America watched as a private family struggle became a very public feud. Terry Schiavo's husband and her parents in Florida have been fighting for a long time about whether her feeding tube should be disconnected. And a personal battle eventually sparked a political firestorm. I'm asking you, you is know, she being murdered? An extraordinary session here on Capitol Hill. Tonight, this Congress is about to commit a travesty. Today, we're still grappling with end-of-life issues. But will scientific advancements help to clarify them or only make them more complicated? Some patients who appear to be entirely vegetative are actually quite the opposite. Terry Schiavo's case started long before the cameras appeared. It was February of 1990 when the 26-year-old suffered a cardiac arrest. She went several minutes without oxygen from her collapse and um experienced a profound brain injury. The first uh, couple days, doctors didn't know if she was going to live or die. Lack of oxygen left Shivo with severe brain damage and in what doctors call a persistent vegetative state, or PVS, a condition in which the parts of the brain that control thinking and awareness are damaged or destroyed. Only the brain stem, which controls basic reflexes like breathing, remains. Initially, Terry's husband and parents cared for her together exploring potential treatments and rehabilitation. But four years after her collapse, Michael Schiavo says doctors gave him a grim prognosis. It was to a point where Terry wasn't going to function. There was nothing more, and they, and they told us. Her mother was sitting right there at the time. There was nothing more they can do for Terry. In 1998, Michael Schiavo petitioned to have his wife's feeding tube removed, saying she had told him and others she wouldn't want to live in this condition. Her parents, Bob and Mary Schindler, fought desperately to keep her alive, insisting that removing her feeding tube would be tantamount to murder. People think Terry was in a coma, she was brain dead, uh, that she was terminal. Terry was not dying. Terry had a, a profound brain injury, and our family wanted to care for her just the way she was. With no living will expressing her wishes, it was up to the state courts to decide Terry's fate. They went to court more than anybody has ever gone to court, in my experience, in fighting about an end-of-life care case. This was probably the most litigated case that I can think of. We were up and down the federal court system, the state court system, many, many times. At least 19 judges heard the case through various appeals, 
and the decisions were all ultimately in Michael Schiavo's favor, going back to the original court ruling that said that there was clear and convincing evidence that Terry would not want to be kept alive and that her feeding tube should be removed. She told me what she And we want to thank, of course, the New York um, Times for allowing us to use that clip. Um, so I have the pleasure again to introduce someone that I highly respect as an attorney. I like to always say that we have a wonderful judicial community, um, judges who sow and mentor us. And um, this judge is a very humble judge. Um, he is a Pinellas Pasco Circuit Court retired judge. He is a former Pinellas County Commissioner, and he is on our board for the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. And most importantly, he is a kind person who gives tirelessly to our community. So with that, I hope that was short enough. <laughs> No, and I'm going to ask you to pick up the microphone and today um, share a little bit of your thoughts before we get started with questions about your reflection and time and um, how you feel looking back before we get into detailed questions. I also want to remind the audience that if they have questions, our in-person audience, of course you have note cards, but you can also text um, and we'll have the text information behind us. And our virtual office, please feel free to do the same. Hopefully technology will work, sometimes it does not, and we will um, put your questions up as soon as possible. So with that, Judge, you have the floor for a little bit. I'll be brief. Uh, Terry uh, was bulimic. Uh, she'd been heavy as a teenager and um, went on crash diets and so forth, and she became bulimic and ended up with a potassium imbalance, which co created the cardiac arrest in February of 1990, uh, some three years before I became a judge. Uh, I probably had some ministerial actions in this guardianship case over time, and it wasn't until um, July of 1999 when I got the case full bore. We went to trial in January of 2000. Um, I heard the evidence, it was a week-long trial. Uh, I ruled, and interestingly enough, the, the request of the husband, who was also the court-appointed guardian, was to give him the ability to withdraw the nutrition and hydration tube, which I granted the motion, went up on appeal and, and went around and Certain things happened. The state of Florida passed a law which allowed the governor to replace or withdraw the feeding tube, which he did. And we had a second trial, and it had to do with whether or not there was any new treatment that she would elect to undergo as opposed to having the tube withdrawn. That was a seven-day trial. And at the end, I ruled there really wasn't any uh, new treatment which would have her make that sort of decision. As was mentioned in the video, this case went all the way up and down the Florida court systems, went all the way up and down the federal court systems. And ultimately, uh, she passed on March the 31st, 2005. And since that, five years later, a little more than five years, I retired. I've been retired since the end of December of 2010. I did serve 18 years as a judge. Uh, which, in my humble opinion, is the highest job anybody in the legal profession can have. Uh, I did the best I could, and I, I have no real regrets on the case. I have regrets on, on how it played out. I think that was unfortunate. But the legal decision was, was not complicated, and it was affirmed by every appellate judge that, that looked at the case, and there were a whole bunch of them. I'm going to use your terminology. There were a whole bunch of them. Um, every time I'm before a judge, I go into bad habits of reading too much. So I've been up far too long reading opinions <laughs> for the past 24 hours so that I could have a clear understanding. And I was struck by um, the specific legal issues related to separation of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial branch and how a lot of the legal decisions were very structural or procedural as they went up and down, as you said, both the state and federal court system. Um, what would you just say to the average person about um, the importance of um, maintaining judicial integrity as a co-equal balance of power? 
It's critical. Uh, the public needs to understand that the courts are a co-equal branch of government. Uh, going back to civics in high school, were it not for the courts, we would have anarchy because the majority of the people in, in the public square would control what happened. And we do have elections, majority controls that, but the courts are there as an impartial arbiter of what the uh, legislative branch passes and what the executive branch decides to enforce. So it's, it's absolutely critical that we do maintain neutrality and that the public believes that we do. So, of course, it's been many, many years, and um, when you look at the time period, you had so many people um, speaking on the subject. But now having the time to reflect and look back about the impact, what would you say would be the greatest impact looking back, and would you have changed anything? You mentioned you would, the legal issues were the legal issues, but looking back, do you have any um, changes in perspective on the to totality of the circumstances of that type of perspective, any changes? Not really, Kim. I, I think it's critical that, that I was able to hold my ground, because uh, if I hadn't, if I'd have capitulated to either the legislative branch or the executive branch, it would, I think, nationally would have weakened the, uh, the ability of the courts to be perceived as a third co-equal branch of government. I'd like to talk about how the case impacted you personally. Um, I thought about this as I was reading the information last night, how it affects millions of people personally now about taking the time to write down their wishes, be specific about their wishes with their family, um, how they need to revisit that, how that has to be communicated not just to one person but to several people and the many contexts that that falls under. But, you know, that's just the... Um, the impact that's left from the case, I think one of the largest ones actually, about um, a private person taking the time to be reflective about how they want to have ended life. But personally, being in that space, um, how did that impact you personally? Well, Terry was 26, and at that, back in 1990, no, no mid-20s person had a thought about end of life. Uh, we were immortal. Uh, we were going to live forever, and we just didn't want to do anything that might indicate that we were not. I think the real positive impact of the Terry Schiavo case was that young, middle-aged, old people, and I qualify as the latter, uh, do know how important it is to write things down. Uh, there are two documents that are very important in that regard. One is a living will, which permits the physicians to stop treatment, and the other is a health care surrogate, which appoints somebody to make medical decisions for you. And you can be as specific as you want within the health care surrogate. Surrogacy, I guess, is the right word for that. But, but I think that's the true impact of the Terry Schiavo case, is that people become aware of, of wanting to do that, wanting to have discussions, making sure that there's nothing left for people to fight about. And, and that is her legacy, I believe. It's a huge delicacy. As you're talking about um, advanced medical directives, um, I know that many of you all in the community teach and still practice in some capacity or other. Do you, are you ever asked to talk specifically about how this case created the legislation that sort of teaches all of us about advanced medical directives, about wills, about estate planning? Short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the, I've been asked, I wrote a chapter in a book, um, and two of the co-authors were judges, our judges in D.C., and they teach at Georgetown and George Washington Law School. And I'm, a couple times a year I appear at those classes uh, via Zoom, of course. And the questions, a lot of them deal with the uh, politicization of the courts. There's been a lot of stuff written and talked about these days on in that regard, uh, and a lot of them deal with how I responded, how my wife responded, uh, what it was like out there, and it was, uh, it was a little crazy. Can you expand on that, because you're writing a book now? No, no I'm not. not gonna, I did a chapter. You did a chapter, okay. <laughs> One out of 13. <laughs> uh, 
the last chapter, interestingly enough, is also a Florida judge who had the Ilian Gonzalez case in Miami. Uh, judge Jennifer Bailey, and she and I went through New Judges School together in 1993. But there were judges from all around the country with what, what they considered to be their tough case. And uh, New, New World Publishing, I believe it is, published the book, and it's out there. And they honored me by making mine the first chapter. <laughs> so. Um, but the impact on you personally with, you know, I would, without knowing details, um, any case is a difficult case. Trials are difficult things to do. Um, people don't understand it takes a toll. It's very financially um, exhausting. It's exhausting, of course, on the parties. It's exhausting on the attorneys. It's exhausting on the judges. Um, but this case, of course, was heated. So um, looking back at this time period, was it challenging to your family core to try to navigate and keep up your professional and fiduciary obligations and yet push off um, the public during the space? Well, the impact was not really on my work. Uh, that was there. And I had a case, you know, calendars every day and, and I discharged them as best I could. The real impact was on after work and before work. Uh, we had details of un undercover deputy sheriffs at our home 24 seven. Um, they took us wherever we went. I wore a bulletproof vest when I wasn't in the courthouse and wasn't at home. When I walked the dog, I wore a bulletproof vest. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the undercover deputies walked too close and the dog would lose interest in why he was outside. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to caution them about that. Um, but it, that, that was impactive. It, it just changed things. When I went to get a haircut, uh, I had two, well, I had one, because one stayed at the home, take me to get a haircut. Uh, when they took us out of town twice, the sheriff flew us out of town twice. Uh, first time I remember, we, there were like nine cars total took us to St. Pete, Florida Airport. And for whatever it's worth, we have wonderful law enforcement in Pinellas County, Florida, both on the deputy sheriff uh, not deputy, on the sheriff's level, um, but also our city people. The city of Clearwater had a portion of our protection. The sheriff had a portion of our protection. And I grew up here, and I, I've, I've known law enforcement my whole life. And I'm great confidence in them. My wife, unfortunately, did not have that upbringing. And so she was much more concerned about us than I was. But she never let it show. She was a trooper. I can only imagine. What would you say about, um, because you're from here, and because we have a small circle of community leaders and congressional leaders who are actually from our small area, did relationships change, or was anything stressed as a, rela as a result of um, the times of what was going on? Actually, no. Um, even though some people very close to me voted for Terry's Law in Tallahassee, uh, they said mea culpa enough that, that I accepted that. And, and, and I understood the political pressure that are put on politicians. I used to be one. So I'm not going to hold it against you if you vote some way that, that you feel you have to for your political best interest. Because it's very important for good people to stay in office. Um, so. But in, in terms of relationships, it, it really did not affect uh, my relationships with people. I mean, Congressman Young stayed a friend. Senator Jones stayed a good friend. Um, county commissioners that I knew stayed good friends. So that, that, it, it, it did not impact me in that way. And so um, based on your depth of knowledge and I was trying to think about the parallels between this time period when you have the intersection of um, the judiciary, the executive and legislature, and personal choices. Do you find um, any parallels um, in society from cases that happened during that time period and now? I'm not certain I... Get understand that. the question? Well, I was thinking about, and we were talking ahead of time about, you know, that was the beginning of social media, and that was the beginning of 
advocacy groups. It was the beginning of worlds converging. You know, there's a time period where we didn't have this much interaction with each other. And then there's this period of a time where advocacy becomes a media um, space where we're engaging heavily. And now we're in a space where we're in a hyper engaged space with each other. So I just wondered about, you know, your thought process reflective from that time to now with advocacy. Well, it, it's just gotten worse, candidly. I don't do social media, but there were there were some bloggers out there. There was one in New York that, that, that hated Florida courts. She must have had a bad... Uh, situation here and specifically hated me and, and she could take a kernel and turn it into an entire cornfield. She found somehow where my wife had written a check to Senator Jim King in Jacksonville and as always used our post office box because our home address is protected and wrote like a nine page blog about that and just rehashed Shivo, claimed I had you know, control over all these elected officials. Boy, I wish she was right in that regard. Um, and gave our home address right there in her blog. Uh, but it, there's just more of that now. And, and why, why people just don't do the right thing because somebody's out there with a camera and a, and a recording instrument. And whatever you say or do is going to end up on social media. Before I um, get into some of the pre-submitted questions that are here, um, do you think that, in general, um, the bar now does a good job of explaining to the general public the importance of these issues and how we engage with the community? Meaning, you know, a lot of this, is, as I was just talking about, of pre-preparing, of discussing this with your family, of having your wishes done, and it not being... Um, I hate to use a basic word like scary, such a scary proposition to engage in this type of pre-planning. But do you think the bar does a good job of explaining to the public why this is so important for end of life decisions and decisions in general about how we um, value our lives? I was thinking about care plans and, you know, life has evolved so much along with science, you know, uh, do, we, do, do we as members of the bar do a good job of explaining to the public the importance of this? I think the local bars do a pretty good job at that. And I think the Florida bar uh, is so far removed that, that I don't know if they delegate or just anticipate the local bars will pick that up and go forward with it. Um, but it's something the, the bar has to do. The courts can't. We can't talk about cases. It's, it's something we cannot do. Um, we we can't even discuss, quote, an impending case. Doesn't have to be filed, but if it's something down the road that's probably going to get filed, we, we're not supposed to talk about it. So we, we just kind of have to s sit in the courthouse, and unfortunately that makes us aloof to some extent, but I think that's just our role. Uh, we are not part of the village square, if you will, where we listen to people um, I was in London one time, and, and they have a square there next to Kensington Park where people get up and talk, and uh, that's supposed to persuade people. And, and if, if judges were out there in those situations, to, to some extent you get persuaded if you like what the person is saying. So we need, to, we need to be removed from that and just make decisions based upon what we hear in the courtroom. It's interesting that you said that because I, in reading this again, going through many cases, um, you were in fact the only fact finder. Is that right? Like the, the only actual? Oh no, there were millions of fact finders out fact there. <laughs> <laughs> for, for this particular case, because this question comes from an, an audience um, or participant that was pre-submitted that said, did you have any input in the trial from nurses at the facility where, the ter where Terry was staying? or from medical professionals, which of course you had many medical professionals, but they were experts. Well, the first trial, the only medical expert I had, I believe, was a treating physician. And he also testified at the second trial, where we had five board-certified neurologists testify, two of whom appointed by the parents, two of whom appointed by the, the husband slash guardian. 
And the appellate court said, they will select a fifth if they can't, the court selects a fifth. And I knew those folks could not agree that tonight is Thursday. So I went looking. And I ultimately found a, a board certified neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic who, and I only had two questions of him. First question was, do you have any pre preconceived ideas about this case? And he said, no. And I said, are you willing to serve? And he said, yes. And that's all I asked him. I was not remotely interested in, in what he was going to tell me. I just, he was board certified, he was qualified, and whatever he came up with, I was going to listen to. And I listened to the other four as well, one of whom was Dr. Greer from Gainesville. So we had to spend a little bit of time d dismissing the fact that not only were we not related, but we didn't even know each other. I think for, um, again, for those people who don't understand the process, can you explain to just, you know, our general audience um, how the case proceeded and some of the challenges within the case that you found? Well, my, my initial judgment was appealed to the Second District Court of Appeal in Tampa. Uh, that was a three-judge panel, and they affirmed me. Uh, the issue was, the real issue on appeal was whether or not there was a guardian ad litem for her at the trial. And that court made an interesting uh, uh, ruling. They said, in these cases, the court serves as guardian ad litem. Now, she had had a guardian ad litem who was dis discharged by the judge who had the case before I did. He testified at the trial. His report was in evidence. So I had ruled when that was brought up at the trial that that would have added nothing to the case to have a, another lawyer asking questions and presenting witnesses. Uh, that was appealed to the Florida Supreme Court, who affirmed it went up the federal system, uh, came back, and the parents filed a lawsuit in tort. They were seeking damages from Michael Schiavo for abuse. And the uh, hydration nutrition tube had already been removed pursuant to my order and I denied the motion and they filed a brand new lawsuit in St. Petersburg uh, seeking that and they filed a motion for a temporary injunction and a duty judge down there heard this motion and they were, the argument was if, if the, she dies, there'll be no proof of what, what he's done. And he ordered the feeding tube put back in. <clears throat> and, and that got appealed, and the Second District Court of Appeals reversed and, and uh, said that he was outside what he should have done. But they ordered a new trial, not, not on what I'd tried before, but on whether or not there was any new evidence or new medical treatment, not evidence, that, that would be persuasive enough that she, on the substituted judgment examination, would, would elect to take and not have the uh, nutrition hydration tube removed. Uh, we had that trial. I ruled that there was no new medical evidence or new medical treatment. And early on in that proceeding, I ruled that the, the phrase new medical treatment uh, amounted to anything she had not received in the past. I wasn't going to get into an argument that, gee, this was around three years ago, it's not new. And one of the experts actually recommended hyperbaric treatment, which is immersing in water and force feeding oxygen into the system. And that goes back to the 19, I mean 1800s, I think. So that clearly would fit no definition of new, but she'd never had that before. So that was tried. I ruled there was no, nothing that I thought uh, she would want. And that went up on appeal. Um, Ultimately, it ended up in the hands of the Florida legislature. During a special session, they were trying to woo scripts from California. So they were in Tallahassee for a week. And I won't bore you with those details, but they passed a law which allowed Governor Bush to put the, the he didn't personally do it, but to order that the tube be reattached, which he did. Um, that law was challenged. Uh, declared unconstitutional by Judge W. Douglas Baird, a colleague of mine, went up to the Florida Supreme Court who affirmed him 7-0. Uh, ultimately, I ruled again that the two to be withdrawn March 18, 2005. Um, 
that day they flew me out of town again. And there was a motion filed by uh, the House Select Subcommittee on Government Reform of the United States Congress to stay my order and to permit them to intervene. And I actually heard that motion going down I-95 uh, toward my undisclosed location. And I, I denied that motion. Um, and the feeding tube, nutrition, hydration tube was withdrawn about one o'clock that day. and She passed 13 days later. Thank you for the explanation because I think um, sometimes it's unclear when you're going through all the emotional issues that the question, at least from my understanding, is that could there be proof that if there were a new procedure, would she have changed her mind about having life um, saving um, procedures to extend her life? And that, that was um, a huge issue. I have some questions that are popping up. I want to thank the audience for putting them in. Remember, you can text them to SBC Seminole 776 to 22333. Um, I'm going to read them in order, but this question is something I think we all just want to know. Why do you think it touched a national nerve? Why this case? At the time, did it touch a national nerve? Well, I'll get real political about that. The, as I understand it, the uh, one party, which happens to be my party, uh, could not give the religious community the marriage amendment. And they felt that this would suffice. The marriage amendment being constitutional amendment, marriage is a union between one man and one woman. Uh, I've heard about emails back and forth that this was a good political thing for the, that party to engage in. One email said, well, what about the judge? And the response was, he's one of us, don't worry about it. Well, I was, I am one of them, and if you got the better facts, you're gonna win. <laughs> so, but I, I think that's what did it. Uh, it. It just got politically charged. The, the religious community, the, uh, the right to life portion of the religious community got involved. I never really understood that. Um, but the only thing I can think of is that if a woman could choose to withdraw life-saving uh, medical procedures for herself, it was not a big step to say she could do that for a fetus. Uh, but I, I, I'll say this, the, uh, the question I asked somebody who should know, I said, if we had had a case involving Terrence Shivo, would this have the same outrage nationally? And I was told that, that a person close to the subject said, no, this has nothing to do with Terry Schiavo, it has everything to do with Roe versus Wade. And, and I had sort of sensed that because during the Schiavo case, I had another case involving a lawyer in St. Petersburg, and he and I were very similar. I did not know the man. Uh, about the same age, remotely, more than one wife, two children, he was a runner. And he was lacing up his running shoes and uh, keeled over in cardiac arrest. Um, the wife, who was Oriental, wanted to try Oriental medicine, did not want life support to be withdrawn. The two children wanted it withdrawn. They said, there's nothing there. We, we had a hearing. I ultimately ruled that life support could be withdrawn. It had a little piece, maybe two by four, in the St. Petersburg Times. Nothing remotely close to the impact of the Terry Schiavo case. And that kind of made me wonder if this really had, was a personal thing or if it was something beyond that. I mean, you have a lot of things in the comments that are coming here. One question um, is, is regarding the judicial process, if you will. Do you think judges today struggle in making a decision based on either their personal beliefs or the law? I think I know that answer, but I'd like to hear your response. Well, we're not to make decisions on what we think it ought to be. Uh, a judge's job is, is very simple, quite frankly. You find out what the facts are, you find out what the law is, you put those two things together, and there's your decision. Uh, what, I, what I think, what, it, what the law ought to be, the only time a trial judge can make law is if there is no law. If this is a case of first impression, I can decide whatever I want to do. But in general, 
an appellate court has, has touched on the subject that I'm dealing with. And I need to find out what the appellate court said and, and rule in, in compliance with that. Um, this person asks, what do you think about, feel about political interference in the courts um, specific to this case? Well, I didn't like it. it, it uh, I've said publicly and privately that the, the Bush brothers either didn't take civics or they slept through it. Um, and, and we have some lawyers in Congress and in the legislature that knew better. And because of political um, reasons, they, they just did what they did. I, I had a congressman, friend, lawyer, tell me, don't take it personal, George. And I said, don't take it personal. I said, Congress comes together on Palm Sunday weekend and passes a law directed to one state court judge, and you don't think I'm going to take that personal? <laughs> so. um, it, it, it was interesting as I'm reading all of this that, um, of course, it fell during Easter weekend. And it was also interesting, um, the discussion by many uh, writers at the time about the judges um, who were making the decisions were primarily Republican appointed justices. But from the educational standpoint, which is what we're here for today, we wanted to teach a younger generation to understand the importance of this case. So this student asks, what should students today learn? Because it's a different context. You know, they're exposed to so much. They can read short snippets of information very quickly. But having you here makes a difference. What would you say to students who are learning about this case now? What would you want them to take away from the importance of this case? Because it's layered with so many different issues. Well, I think the real importance of this case is that the, the gentleman, and it was all gentlemen, obviously, back in the 1780s that put together this government, uh, now the United States of America, they had a plan. And their plan was to have three co-equal branches of government. Um, they knew that without a court system that was non-dependent upon anything other than the courts, and in the federal system that they wrote, they're appointed for life. Uh, states have different ways of, of having judges and how long they serve and when they have to step down, but, but it was very important to them to have an independent judiciary, critically important, because they understood that, that an unbridled executive would become a monarch, that an unbridled legislative branch would become anarchy, and that courts were necessary as a co-equal branch. And, and I, would, I would hope that the young people would, would either take civics or there's enough stuff you know, on the internet to just find out about this government we have and how it was created and why it was created. And it, it's, it still holds true today. Thank you. Um, another participant um, wants to know, have you spoke with anyone in the case since the case, including the family members? Well, I actually met Michael Shivo and the woman who is now his wife uh, at a Christmas party in 2005. Uh, I had not met them before. Um, I don't think I've seen them since. Uh, I was asked, I did an interview on WFLA TV for Mark Douglas at the 10-year uh, anniversary of her passing. And Mark's been a friend for a long time. He's now retired. But he said, what would you say to Bobby Schindler or the Schindlers if you had to talk to him now? I said, nothing. Um, I, the case is over. Uh, it, it's, it's part of history, and, and uh, the historians will, will let us know what, what I did was good, bad, or indifferent. During the time period, there was also talk of euthanasia, and so this person asked, did you have any opinion, or did that come up during the case at all, during the trial? Well, they, they kept likening me to Dr. Kevorkian, um, and was this euthanasia? The answer is no. Um, this is self-determination. Uh, was what it really was. And I actually did a speech one time about euthanasia in Holland, 
I ran across a three-part um, op-ed in the Boston Globe about this. Her dohen is is the is the word. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it, it, it's a Dutch word, and it's halfway between legal and illegal. And euthanasia was illegal in Holland. However, you could do it if you followed the government prescribed procedure, which I thought was kind of odd. But I mean, the, the Dutch are they're different. They helped settle this country. And remember, New York used to be New Amsterdam. Do you think your impact, of course, well, of course, has a national impact, a national footprint, but do you think that states made a concerted effort to change laws um, after this case, specific to um, the issues related to right to life and right to die? Do you think this case impacted that? Kim, I don't know of any law that was passed pursuant to this case except one in Louisiana which said that a guardian who, her husband or a spouse, no, not, it wasn't gender specific, who had committed adultery could not make this kind of decision. And that's it. I don't know of anything that's even been proposed in Florida uh, to change anything that was in effect. And, and the legislation that, or the laws that were out there were actually spawned by, I guess, Representative Jim King before he became a senator. Um, he, he was pretty passionate about that. And so the, the laws are in effect during the Shibo case were, were those that he had promulgated and gotten through the Florida legislature. Yeah, there, cause there was a lot of um, discussion about that, about who has the right, of course, which is resolved by how we write our wishes down. Um, this person asks, current technology might affect how we understand um, a vegetative state, which I'm sure was very complex for most people to understand. You had images and pictures and video, and then of course you had medical experts talking about um, this persistent vegetative state. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I never heard the phrase until I got the case, very candidly. We, we all talked about coma. And coma, you think of a person lying there just asleep. And I had a friend, uh, probably 1987, thereabouts, went into cardiac arrest and went into what we all thought was a coma. And I went to visit him. And what we didn't know was there is something out there called PVS. And what we didn't know is PVS has sleep and wake cycles, unlike a coma. Well, he's moving about. I'm coming up with all these phrases that, that I'd used with him or that he had used. And I mean, he'd been very helpful to me in my 1984 uh, campaign for county commission. And I'm thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something, he's going to wake up. I mean, I was just incredibly hopeful about that. And I never understood any of that until I actually got the Terry Schiavo case. That this, it, it is not a coma, it is different. And absent an explanation, you look at that person and think they're going to be waking up, which is what I thought. And that's the reason I never went to see her, was I, I would not know what I was seeing. Uh, I saw probably hours of videos. I had hours of testimony of doctors telling me what's on those videos. So that's what I was concerned about is what a medical professional would say that the videos represented, not what me as a layperson uh, would infer or assume they were representing. It had to be difficult testimony at times when you have battle of experts and them having competing views on where she was. Um, this person asked, which I think is a really good question, what are some of the questions you wish people had asked you about the case? Why didn't you grant one of those seven motions to disqualify yourself? <laughs> There's that humor outside of that question, Judge. <laughs> no. I. I Again, judges are supposed to base what we do on what we hear in the courtroom when both sides are there, both sides are represented. Questions from the outside or, or information from the outside, we're just not supposed to receive. A few exceptions being court counsel, uh, court administration, things like that we're able to go to. But I, I cannot go to the, to the village drugstore and sit around having coffee on a Saturday morning and say, what do you guys and gals think about this? I can't do that. 
that would be very helpful. That would be help my stress level if I could do that, if I could get a sounding board from people I know and like. I just can't do that. Do you think guardianships are different now because of this case, that we put a lot more emphasis on understanding the process, or do you think not much has changed since then? Not the actual writing of advanced medical directives or will and estate planning, but the actual process. Kim, you're asking the wrong person about what's changed. Uh, I was on the bench for five years after that. I'm about to wrap up my 11th year of retirement. Uh, Process-wise, I, I have no, no feeling or understanding about what's happened. As we wrap up, what do you want to share um, with our audience, here in person or virtually, about this case and its impact overall? Again, this is it's a pleasure to speak with you about these issues. Some of them are just really challenging and quite frankly can't be answered. I mean, from my perspective, they're circular in terms of how we as um, individuals engage in the political process, how we understand our co-equal branches of government, how that engages with our value system, and what we do individually to protect our private rights. And so I know from my perspective, reading all this, it was very impactful and it forces you to think about these very tough decisions that individuals make, that our congressional leaders make, and that um, those who impact the system make. But what would you want to say overall that you haven't shared, that you now have the opportunity to share? I kind of think I've said it all. <laughs> Uh, what, what I really hope people get from this is that they need to go see their attorney and they need to discuss with family members and they need to put down in writing what they feel about their latter days, what, what should happen. Uh, I do remember Governor Bush trumpeting the fact that during all this he and his wife had signed living wills. And had I been able, I'd have liked to have gone up to him and say, well, well tell me something, Governor. Are your, is your living will like mine that says if nothing really can help us to go ahead and let us go? Or do you want to be kept alive till the second coming? I mean, he never told us what it says, just that he had one. And quite frankly, I don't care what your living will says or your advanced directive. If you want to be kept alive, if, if there's any ounce of life in your body, that's fine. But, but you need to tell folks and you need to put it in writing so it... it the likelihood of it being challenged will be lessened. Now, one, uh, I may have said this earlier, one difference between a living will and a healthcare surrogacy, living will is permissive. It is not mandatory. The healthcare surrogacy is mandatory, and if your surrogate won't do what you want, they need to resign. That alone is um, challenging to even know if the surrogate um, is capable of when it comes down to it making those decisions on your behalf, right? Make sure they're younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> I did get one other comment here, and I always like to make sure that we address all questions from the audience. And so um, forgive me as the eyes are changing over time. It says, I didn't understand why Terry's husband didn't appear before a congressional committee when requested or subpoenaed. Do you have, um, can you enlighten the audience on the process at the congressional level when the motion was filed to delay um, for purposes of doing further exploration of the issues before you denied the motion? Well, the motion was filed the week of Palm Sunday, and it was heard on the 18th, which was Friday, before Palm Sunday. Congress came together that weekend, and they passed this law. Uh, President Bush was in Texas. He flew to Washington Sunday night, I think, or Sunday afternoon. I'm not certain about all the nuances, but I almost think you can't, the president can't sign a bill on Sunday. So it had to flip over into Monday for him to sign it. I know nothing about a subpoena on Michael Schiavo. Uh, don't, this is the first time I've ever heard about it. Not certain I could get a subpoena out on Saturday to appear on Sunday. Um, I think the timing of that would be a little suspect. But if you get subpoenaed, I would, I would tell anybody, 
else, that's a requirement to appear, and, and you need to honor the subpoena if you get served. Well, I don't think we have any other questions. I think that um, reviewing the stories of this time period is so important when we think about our history and our ability now, at least in this technological space, to um, go back and look at fo footage with a critical eye and review um, is very helpful to understand the issues and see it from a different lens now that we have some space to absorb and discuss these issues. Uh, and talking to people, I don't feel like they feel any less charged than they did during that time period. I always try to get a feel of a uh, subject matter before we discuss it to make sure that we're balanced with all sides of the issues. What I've gleaned from the conversations from this particular topic is that um, our personal decisions, particularly regarding the most vulnerable space, which is in end of life, are challenging, and they're challenging regardless of the situation. And the best thing that we can do is make sure that we prepare for that space and write down with clarity what our wishes are. So with that, I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to go into my ISPS spiel. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to thank, again, we have a couple of programs coming up, and we hope that you will continue to join us as we explore different programs throughout um, the year. Our programs are always recorded. You can go to our website at any time at isps.spcollege.edu, and where you can see our past programs under our event page and our upcoming programs. We have a program on clean energy, which we'll have at our beautiful SBC Bay Pines STEM Center, and that's on November 9th. We hope that you'll join us for that. It's going to be a discussion on solar energy and the impact of how we're going to change growth in the industry. And after that program, we're going to have another program, which is quite interesting, and that is a international student program. We have been trying to do engagement um, for a while. Um, one of our board members is very passionate about the intersection of the United States and China. And we were privileged enough to have a program with students from China, along with our students, where we will have discussions about cybersecurity, hacking, and TikTok. So we hope that goes well, and we hope that you'll join us. I would be remiss if I didn't say for the clean energy bill that we're going to have Lisa Perry, who's a senior, senior energy manager from Walmart, and Emily Nips with the Tampa International Airport for the prior program. Finally, I want to say is we want to hear from you of how you want to get, engage and what subjects you want to hear about. It's really important for us to be um, the voice within the county to discuss these topics in depth and to hear what you have to say on them. So you can learn more about us on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. And before I go, I would want to thank again WUSF, Tampa Bay Newspapers, Peggy Land for sponsoring this, and Duke Energy. And I want to say that um, be the change you want to see is something that I've been re very reflective about lately as we continue to grow and thrive in our community and make it stronger. Be the change you want to see. Thank you so much, Judge, for your time. My pleasure, Kim. Good night.